Rolo V. Let's try that again. Now that we know we're being recorded. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for a very timely topic about a current front page news virtually every day now, and that being uh, the cyclical droughts or current future impacts to Southern California. I'm Charlie Wilson. I'm the executive director and CEO of the Southern California Water Coalition, and I'm very pleased to moderate today's program for the Orange County Water District in its webinar series. Before we formally get started, though, I do have a couple of housekeeping items that I just want to keep you mindful of. As a webinar attendee, you are all muted. That's to reduce background noise so we can hear uh, the conversation with our guests today. But we do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, so you'll find down at the lower part of your screen, the Q&A box. If you have a question for our panel today, please go to that Q&A box, type your question in, and staff's going to monitor that, and they'll be feeding me questions throughout the, the uh, program. Uh, we'll do our very best to get to all your questions, and I will incorporate as many as I can into our conversation. Uh, but if for some reason we don't get to your question, uh, please also email it to info at ocwd.com so we could address them after the, pres the presentation. Uh, I know the folks at OCWD want a chance to be able to field all your questions, make sure you get answers to some of the questions and where we're going. Also let you know that we are being recorded today. Uh, and that is because it will be posted uh, following or shortly following today's uh, discussion to the OCWD YouTube channel. That's OCWD Water News. So for friends and others, if you want to say, hey, did he really say that? Or, you know, just to share with some, fan, uh, some friends uh, about what we're going to talk about, uh, please direct them to the YouTube channel. So less of me, more of our panel is better today. So let me get into our introductions so we can start our conversation about drought, how we're dealing with the current drought, and importantly, how are we going to get ready for the next drought, or at least the cyclical dry times we are now clearly confronting in California. And to help us do that, we have four really outstanding presenters. Uh, I want to start first with uh, James Bodner. James is the Water Transfer and Exchange Program Manager for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Uh, Dan Denham. Dan is the Deputy General Manager of the San Diego County Water Authority. Our host and general manager of the Orange County Water District, Mike Marcus. And then batting cleanup, Paul Cook, our general manager with the Irvine Ranch Water District to give us that retail water perspective. So gentlemen, thank you again for joining and being a part of this conversation. It seems that uh, as news is on the front page of the paper, it's on the evening newscast, uh, obviously uh, water drought become very much uh, the top of mind as I saw just this morning with the latest uh, PPIC polling that now over 63% of Californians really kind of get we're in a drought cycle. Uh, James, let me start though with you as the, as the largest wholesaler in North America and really the, the, the entity responsible for uh, providing reliability to a very large swath of Southern California. I mean, what is the drought situation really like from the metropolitan standpoint, both at the state level and then here in Southern California? Yeah, before I get too much into that, I just want to start. Metropolitan's been thinking about drought since 1928. I mean, really, Metropolitan's formation started with thinking about how do we ensure the reliability for Southern California. And that, with the construction of the Colorado River Aqueduct, which is right behind me, um, that's really where Metropolitan started with its uh, member agencies. And then later on, we, we realized that the Colorado um, River Aqueduct wasn't going to be enough. So we started and participated in the state water project in the 1960s. And we've continued our, our efforts in terms of encouraging conservation and local project developments, developing uh, regional storage reservoirs and, and uh, following programs and um, state water project, groundwater storage programs. And Metropolitan's just uh, more, more recently looking at the regional recycled water project. Now, getting focused into what's happening this year in 2021, uh, it looks like we're going to be okay. Looking at our current trends of supplies and demands, the water supply situation looks okay. And I want to just stress the word okay simply because we're already looking at next year. And what we do this year will help us or hurt us next year. If, if we're not conserving, if we're not looking at our future um, potential issues, we're going to be in a lot more difficult situations. So 
Um, this year, our supplies and demands look like they're going to be balanced. Metropolitan's going to have sufficient supply, supplies for our member agencies. But I want to stress that next year, we're looking at a, a potential 0% initial state water project allocation. That looks like a, a very likely reality under the current low water supply conditions in the state of California. So with that, it really makes it extremely difficult for Metropolitan uh, to set us up for success. We're already looking at developing new programs to ensure reliability in 2022. And I do wanna have some, start with some, some uh, takeaway points. I, I think uh, no single action is gonna get us through this drought or any future drought. I mean, we can't just look at the Colorado River supply or state water project supplies or local supplies. You know, stormwater capture is not going to solve the problem. Uh, water recycling is not going to resolve the problem. You need, you need imported water. You need, you need water to recycle. Uh, so a successful drought response is going to require all sorts of different strategies. And they're going to have to work together to be uh, successful. And I think the, the second point that I'd make is that our region will depend strongly on our continued collaboration with, with uh, stakeholders, with our member agencies in ensuring that we can improve reliability in the future. Well, recognizing the role that you play, I know then we kind of sort of work our way down into Southern California proper. Uh, Dan, I know in San Diego, uh, you've had a very aggressive program looking at that, I'll call it sub-regional, you know, San Diego County, your San Diego County members. Um, and looking at localized production, localized reliability. Um, give me kind of a, a perspective, sort of the unique difference between sort of what James and what Metropolitan are responsible for, and then kind of some of the unique issues that you've addressed locally to address some of your hydrology and your constituency. Dan, go ahead and unmute. All right, we are not hearing Dan. Uh, he has gone on mute. Um, I'm gonna ask staff if you can unmute Dan, help him. Try again. There you go. Yes, that was the problem that I was trying to uh... I was hoping you could read my lips, Charlie. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Working together. No. <laughs> this this um, is how we solve water issues, Daniel. We we just we 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 see the panic on the screen and then we go. <laughs> we read we read lips and 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 other uh, other social cues. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, I, I guess from you know the San Diego perspective, um, you know we we serve water from Camp Pendleton down to Mexico. That's our service area. And al although you know we were created in the '40s and joined Met uh, mm -hmm. shortly thereafter, yeah, I think really our our history, uh, the Water Authority, it really began in the '90s, and and it, it's at that point when we faced um, all of us right in Southern California faced potential for 50% cutbacks, 90% cutbacks in ag. And, and that's at least when our, our community leaders decided to uh, try to change course and, and diversify. And, you know, we've been on that path really um, for the past 20 or so years. Um, and I think we've got to a point where we, um, we really have developed a, a diversified uh, water supply portfolio. I think some of the, you know, the early uh, low hanging fruit that we took advantage of was, uh, was conservation. Um, you know, in the 90s, I think uh, we were somewhere around 230, 240 gallons per capita per day. Um, we've seen a 50% drop since then. We're down to 120. Um, I think that conservation, it, it really is sort of hardwired into uh, what, what we do down in San Diego. Um, you know, reclaimed water was, was one of the, the, uh, the first steps as well. We, we put in as our member agencies actually put in as much purple pipe as they could. Um, and, and then we started to, to launch into, um, you know, what, what still is the, the, the largest agricultural to urban water transfer, right, in, in the U.S. And, and that's kind of where we sit right now with 50% of our supplies, um, you know, shortly thereafter, um, as, the, as the quantification settlement agreement ramped up, we, um, we started to embark upon desal, and that desal plant has been uh, operational for five years and, and producing 
you know, candidly drought proof supplies. And so as we look forward to what, what the future brings, um, I think potable reuse is, is it for us. Uh, we have a number of projects that are, that are underway in San Diego and, and should come online here pretty soon. Um, uh, both in uh, City of Oceanside, uh, City of San Diego, and a number of our East County agencies. Um, but, you know, really, I, I think that there's that supply side. There's also the infrastructure side um, that sort of keeps the water flowing. And we've also, while we've, well, while we've developed supplies, we've also made a, a real concerted effort to expand surface water storage. And um, that's very important um, down here in San Diego at, at the end of the pipe. Um, I think there's opportunities for, for expansion further, but I think we'd like to look at some, some more creative ways to, uh, to look, at, look at our system, of course. Um, we have the ability to move water uh, north, south, east, east, and west now as part of our emergency storage program. But I would hope that um, we could start to look at um, how we can integrate Southern California together as one. Um, you know, San Diego certainly has a system. Um, it, it seems to me that, that in the future someday, uh, I should be using some of Mike's groundwater and, and he can have some of my desal water um, and vice versa, right? I, I think that if we, if we start to look at the system in a different way, I think that that perhaps is a tool um, that it's probably gonna be a, a pretty cost-effective tool in, in helping us better manage water supply um, in Southern California. You know, the, the ag to urban transfer that we have with the Imperial Valley it, it really is, is no different than that, but on a much larger scale, transferring a resource from one to another. And, and so I, along with uh, you know, um, reuse projects in San Diego, I'd like to start to talk about and, and look about using our Southern California system differently. Well, now many may have tried, but I'm not yet found anybody that could mute Mike Marcus uh, and the Orange County Water District has been really vocal and really been on the cutting edge of some of these uh, technologies and, and water reuse issues for a long time. Mike, as the groundwater manager in Orange County, I mean, that's obviously very different than what Dan has in San Diego County with having to use surface storage. What kind of innovation and how, how is it that the OCWD really looks to address these dry cycles? Well, yeah, thanks for that, Charlie. And, uh, you know, others have talked, I, I think James and Dan both talked uh, about this portfolio approach. And, and really, uh, we cannot rely on, on, on one source to provide all of our water needs. And, uh, you know, as a result, I think what OCWD has, has demonstrated uh, is uh, development of a supply for the groundwater basin that is resilient, uh, that uh, you know we can depend on. It gives us that that reliability that uh, that we're looking for, and, and and it starts back with our board of directors. Our, our board of directors actually uh, adopted a policy uh, some years ago to maintain a seventy five percent pumping out of the groundwater basin. So. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we're a non-adjudicated basin. Our board sets the, uh, the amount of pumping that can come out of the basin every year in April. And they adopted this policy of 75%, which is uh, historically uh, fairly, fairly high. And in order to do that, we had to develop uh, other sources, other reliable sources of water. And, and we've done that primarily through uh, recycled water. Uh, as, as uh, you may or may not know, we uh, developed a project called the Groundwater Replenishment System. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, the world's largest potable reuse project. Uh, we produce currently 100 million gallons per day, uh, or about 103,000 acre feet per year of a supply that we then put back into the groundwater basin. Uh, so some of this gets injected along a, an existing seawater barrier along the coast and the rest gets pumped up to our recharge facilities uh, some 17 miles away from our plant here in Fountain Valley where uh, the water uh, goes back in into the ground. So that, that project currently gives us about one third of the supply uh, that, uh, that we need uh, to support that, uh, that higher uh, pumping percentage. And, uh, and we're expanding the project. Right now we're going through a final expansion. We'll be done the first quarter of 2023, expanding from 100 MGD to 130 MGD. 
Uh, so about 134,000 acre feet of water per year. So direct supply into the groundwater basin. Uh, and that'll be enough water for uh, a little over a million people. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't mention, I, I mean, MET has a huge service area, San Diego as well. Our service area, our 19 retail water agencies uh, supply water for about 2.5 million people. Uh, so that's, that's kind of our demographic. Now, in, in the hopes of also trying to build that portfolio approach, we've also looked into stormwater capture. And uh, our form of uh, stormwater capture is to work co collaboratively with the US Army Corps of Engineer, which owns and operates a, uh, a dam facility upstream of our recharge uh, basins uh, uh, in the upper watershed, Prado Dam. And we have worked collaboratively with the Corps uh, to enable us to store water during the winter behind the dam. Uh, normally what happens uh, with these flood control facilities uh, here in the, uh, in the arid Southwest is when it rains, they try to get rid of the water behind the dam as quickly as possible and release it downstream into the ocean. And our agreement allows us to store uh, up to 20,000 acre feet per storm behind the dam and then slowly release it. Uh, until the water is drained and then hopefully we get another storm and we're able to fill that back up and uh, uh, and as a result be able to significantly capture storm flow when it rains and and, and of course this is the problem uh, you know we get a lot of recharge natural recharge when it rains we get storm water when it, uh, when it rains uh, but uh, because of the variability in our rain patterns, uh, that doesn't occur all the time. Now, as water managers, uh, you know, myself having lived here my entire life, uh, we're used to this, the drought cycle. Uh, you know, it is not uncommon to have seven years of below average rainfall, followed by a couple of years of above average rainfall. I think what we're seeing, though, is those, those below average years are a lot lower than they've been in the past. And those above average are a lot higher. And so that's really the challenge that we're faced as water managers, I think moving in is, is how do we develop projects that can uh, uh, capture these, uh, these extreme flows? How to, you know, what impact does that have on our system? Uh, certainly, like I mentioned before, recycle water, we don't have that problem. We can, we, can, uh, uh, we can produce that water day in and day out irrespective of climate. And, and put it back into the, uh, uh, the groundwater basin. So th those are the types of projects we're looking at. Uh, and uh, I, I think they will enable Orange County to, uh, to get through some of these extreme cycles. In fact, we've seen that we've had to uh, overdraft the basin uh, uh, less in times of drought because we have more dependable supplies to refill it. So uh, I, I guess that's the message. Uh, I, I, I would agree with, uh, with Dan. We, we still need to look at uh, uh, conservation as best we can. We always, we always say that we're using a lot of water outside the house that uh, probably could be, could be saved. But we, we really have to develop, I, I, I guess, a water ethic. We have to start thinking about water and how important it is to us and, and what the water agencies do to provide that water to their customers. I'll end with that, Charlie. Well, that, th thanks for that, Mike. So Paul, then you know, you, you, you've heard from your regional supplier, you, you've heard from your groundwater manager, you're just sitting there uh, waiting for them to deliver water to Irvine Ranch and, and everything's pretty easy, get your feet up on the desk. It makes yeah. Cook's job a hell of a lot easier as a matter of fact. <laughs> he, doesn't have to, he, he, he doesn't have to do anything. I wish, Mike. Well, well, you you have been known to be involved in a few entrepreneurial efforts yourself. Uh, so, Paul, how, how do you then translate all of this to customers? Because where kind of the rubber meets the road really is the, who gets the bill. And I know that uh, you're the one who gets to send that bill out. And how, so how does, in a serious note, how does Irvine Ranch really go about trying to balance out these issues and then making sure that your customers are aware of, of the value proposition that's water? Yeah, that's really the key link. I, I, I do very much appreciate looking at my two major suppliers, Metropolitan and Orange County Water District, um, and the, the, the work they've done to manage the resources they have access to. So we, as one retail agency, and all of us who have met an OCWD um, as our sources uh, can enjoy 
um, the fruits of their labor, but it really is a team effort. You know, we're working uh, with each other, um, off of each other, sometimes on joint projects as well. Um, but from the retail perspective that, that I'd like to talk to, you know, we're that front line relative to the customer and the customer is ultimately what it really comes down to um, for, for really anything you want to accomplish um, I'm a profound statement, whether you're a business or, in my opinion, a government agency, because the customers will, you know, they, they want to know. They, they pay the bills. They elect your elected officials. Um, it really, really, that's the service we provide. That's what, it, that's what we're here to do. So we have an opportunity to communicate with them as their retail provider. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of our folks in Orange County have heard of Orange County Water District. I'm sure a lot of folks in Southern California have heard of metropolitan, but they know generally who they, whom they pay their bill to. And that gives us a, a leg up in that dialogue. So how do we, how do we work, work with that? What do we, we've made a special effort really starting really, I'd say back in the early, early nineties during that drought to take advantage of, of that crisis to start that dialogue with our customers. And the dialogue really began with, um, you know, the need to use less water. So we were coming off that drought. I think we were still actually in it. And so Irvine Ranch Water District implemented a rate structure. The rate structure is very unique. I won't get into all the aspects of it, but what the, one of the key elements of our rate structure um, gave us the opportunity to uh, have, a have a dialogue with our customers such that if their water bill went up a lot because they were uh, overusing in one month relative to another, they get a much larger bill and they, a lot of them stop and go, wait a minute, what's going on here? They'll either look in their backyard and see that one of their sprinklers is leaking or, or maybe they'll call us and say, hey, why is my water bill so high? And that begins that dialogue. So this has been going on for 30 years now and um, having those conversations with our customers really established a, a great foundation of a relationship. So when we get into conversations about, as Mike called it, a water ethic, efficiency ethic, that ethic is what we want to uh, embrace and, and champion every year. That's why we've gone to great efforts to focus on water use efficiency. So we call water use efficiency um, what we do day in and day out every single year. We're efficient, we're efficient, we're efficient. We're trying to be more efficient, but efficiency is what you do you know, when you buy a, a car that gets better mileage, right? It's, it's you're, you're using less gasoline, so you're being more efficient. The difference is when we head into a drought and then you have to conserve if it's bad enough. And the call for voluntary conservation, the required volunteer, uh, the mandatory uh, conservation we had a few years back, that's when you take those extra measures and, you know, kill your front lawn and, and uh, you know, take a 30 second shower, whatever an individual thinks they can do to, to help uh, solve that problem. So there's really a, two different ways to look at. Um, what we should be doing with this, with this ethic that Mike mentioned. And, and as a retail agency, we really take that seriously and, and have the ability to have that conversation um, because we already have the conversation going with, with, the, with our customers. Uh, our credibility is very important that they trust us and understand it when we say, okay, it's time to you know, tighten up your belt um, or, or whatever, they, they go, okay, it must be because you know, the water district has you know, told me told me what I needed to know in the past. So it's, it's, it's very important to have that ongoing conversation for any water department, any water agency, so your customers know that um, you, are, you are a source of good information when it comes to um, you know, behaviors you should have as a water user. Well, all, all of you have important pieces to play in this. So I'm gonna come back to James and actually, but I'm gonna ask all of you this kind of same question just to kind of jump in. Um, you know, what we've described is sort of this mosaic of various sources, uh, water management, how it comes into the system, how ultimately then it gets utilized, and then the messaging that goes out to customers about the importance of, of efficiency and, and how then this all sort of works together. And I'm already seeing it in some of the questions that come because people sort of lock in on a project, a certain type of function over another almost as if there were silver bullets. Um, if you just did this, then we'd be okay. If we just did that, um, and then everyone kind of 
my experience, everybody kind of digs in into their respective positions. So I'm going to start James. Um, are there really any silver bullets, any one thing that kind of needs to be done? Or is it really this, you know, all the above strategy where you have to do a little bit of investment here, a little bit investment there, communication, um, so that you actually can operate a system as large and as complex as what Southern California and what Metropolitan has to oversee? And I ask then take James off mute as well. So that's the lesson I learned, don't mute myself. So uh, <laughs> I, I think that what we really need to focus, I think we definitely, there's no, all the easy stuff in terms of the water world has been done. I mean, we're, right now we're all the low hanging fruit, all the, the easy projects. I mean, I'm, I'm jealous of the city of Los Angeles, quite frankly, because they not only get water, they get power. I mean, that's just the dream in terms of water supply. Um, but, you know, every, all the low easy stuff has been done. But I think the, the one key thing that was even touched on earlier in terms of collaboration and the interdependence among each of the member agencies and the role Metropolitan can play in that. You know, for example, you know, um, the, the IED transfer to San Diego. Without Metropolitan, it would be much more difficult for that transfer to exist. And th how that water can be regulated or utilized could better benefit the region by cooperating together. So I definitely see areas where um, we can um, continue collaboration, cooperation, and um, but clearly there's nothing easy that's going forward. And we're going to have to look at how each of the different resources within the, the region, whether it's desalination, re, um, recycled water, groundwater storage. And I think Metropolitan plays a key role and responsibility in ensuring the more efficient uh, transfer, conveyance, um, partnership among the member agencies. And, and we've done that. I mean, right now we're facing a, a pretty serious drought and Metropolitan's working with its member agencies. And we're di we did something different this year we are, we're actually compensating our member agencies to shift their supplies to be more on Colorado River supplies behind me than state water project supplies. We have a 5% state water project allocation this year. That's, a, that's the, the lowest allocation it's been. I mean, it happened one time before, but it's the lowest, 5%. And we're really limited on that side. So we're actually compensating member agencies that can shift their demand on Colorado River supplies and we'll compensate them, cover their cost. And that helps the entire region out when that extra water shows up effectively on the state because they've shifted that supply. So um, I, I, I see a lot of future opportunities that we can continue that type of collaboration and prove reliability for the region. Well, that's helpful, Dan. Um, kind of similar question to you. I mean, I, I'm, I can't help but you know, have it ringing in my ear. A big part of why Southern California is sort of in a better position perhaps than other parts of the state through this particular dry cycle was that you know, we had the ability to invest years ago in Diamond Valley Lake. And that surface storage is really a big part of what's helping to sort of bridge through. And but for that investment, you know, the state had not made that kind of investment you know, since the 1960s. Um, San Diego, you've made also significant investment in localized projects. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you balance and go through that equation of what, you know, what do you invest in locally versus, you know, these agreements and, and working with your neighbors to do exchanges or, or that reliance upon some, some of those regional supplies like the Colorado River. I'm going to ask him to be unmuted again. There we go. Thank you. I will not mute myself for the rest of this, this panel. <laughs> Um, you know, in, in, in terms of, of, of what our focus has been, um, I referred to the emergency storage program, and, and that, that was really a decade-long effort to, as I said, be able to interconnect our system. Um, you know, we're all gravity in San Diego, and, and so everything comes down um, from Metropolitan. And 10, 15 years ago, we couldn't move water from south to north. Um, we can do that now and we can move it east to west. And, and along those different conveyance routes, we've, we've added storage. The emergency storage program costs us somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 billion, but um, we also continue to invest in, in raising our, um, our dams as well. Um, the uh, San Vicente Dam raised uh, 
it, it, it provided us another 100,000 acre feet worth of storage. And, um, you know, James, I, I agree with your, your comments about uh, DWP and power. The Water Authority is, is finally starting to get into that as well. Um, we do have um, one pumped hydro project and we just received, uh, we're about to receive 18 uh, million from the state of California to look at another pumped hydro storage facility um, at the San Vicente uh, Reservoir. So um, in terms of prioritizing everything, um, it, it's not cheap, right? Um, I, I think that our annual CIP is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, $100 million. And, and right now that is almost solely focused on, on asset management. And, and pipe relining. That's, that's our focus now. We don't have any additional big storage facilities planned. Um, we're sort of in that operations and maintenance mode right now, or, or at least rehab and replacement for our CIP. Mike, I mean, you obviously, you talked about it in your opening remarks. You've made massive investments in recycled water uh, and really lead the world in that. And now you see uh, LA County and, and a couple of major projects uh, sort of literally replicating what you've been doing for you know 20 years uh, but at the same time as I understand it you know that's not 100 percent it's not a closed loop system you can't just operate like that forever uh, you do take water periodically from metropolitan how, how important then is you know your look at as you said storage storm water you know these other elements to try to supplement what you have is it a, truly a supplement or are those lifelines do you have to have that additional source water well, I, I think that uh, in, in the broad sense, there are supplemental sources. Uh, we do purchase uh, some untreated met water uh, on an annual basis and uh, recharge that. That helps us maintain the higher pumping percentage. So we use the groundwater base net, you know, in essence, as a water treatment plant, a water filtration uh, facility. And uh, I mean, if, if that source wasn't available. Uh, let's say we uh, met was in an allocation and, and wasn't able to provide uh, uh, the same amount of water that we would be used to purchasing. Uh, we would probably be able to live through that for a year or two. Uh, we're, like I said, in managing the basin, we're trying to keep the basin at certain levels so that uh, if we do have extended droughts, we can draw the basin down. Uh, and, and the board has certain triggers at which uh, if those levels got too low, that they would actually reduce the amount of pumping out of the basin. So a, as a management tool. So that's, that's part of uh, the determination that we have to make on, on a year to year basis is, uh, you know, how far do we want to overdraft? Uh, we want to try to keep that uh, pumping as, uh, as high as possible for our retail water agencies, there's there's a benefit in that uh, groundwater costs about half what met water costs. So the more, you know, if we reduce the amount of pumping out of the basin, they have to purchase more met water. Uh, so it, it, it is a bit of a balancing act, but uh, I think with the recycled water program, particularly once we have the final expansion completed a couple of years down the road, uh, we won't see those big swings. Uh, if, if we were to not be able to purchase as much met water as we had in the past, uh, I, I think we'd still be okay. In fact, we may not need to purchase much met water moving forward in the future. We're looking at water demands, uh, you know, out 30 years from now, and those demands not increasing significantly. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll use that to manage along with the storm water. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of go back uh, to, the, to the comments about regional approaches and just compliment MET on their LRP program, their local resources program. For those of you that don't know, MET actually will pay uh, other, their uh, member agencies uh, a certain amount of money to develop uh, projects that may, may be more, cost them more than net water to bring those costs down closer to net water. Uh, and that takes the burden off of MET having to supply uh, that, that amount of water to those agencies. So uh, another type of regional program that helps kind of solve our overall uh, water supply reliability issue in the region. 
Well, Paul, that actually is a kind of a, a nice jumping off point because my, what Mike's comments, at least how I interpret them, is sort of this is part of that that, that blended mix, right? You're, you've got some local supply development that is perhaps more, well, usually more expensive other than that conservation piece, uh, metropolitan incenting or subsidizing to try to get those things online to help incent people to diversify that portfolio. And at Irvine, you, I mean, you, you guys are pretty sophisticated about portfolio management and then how that then translates into your rate structure, which is, you know, for a long time, very different than how sort of traditional water agencies approach things with just doing annualized sales. Um, describe for me a little bit, because you guys are, are kind of unique in that portfolio issue. So the, the portfolio approach that we've taken um, is, it really goes back to that same time frame of the early 90s, and we were we were probably 65% reliant on just on net water. And that was um, awkward when Met was really cutting back at that time. And that really inspired our board to take some pretty direct action. So we've moved uh, a lot more into the groundwater supplies. And not only, um, as, as I, like, I like how James teed up the, the easy water projects. I call it easy water, that's over. Uh, easy water for us was you know popping another well um, in the Orange County groundwater basin. Although that wasn't entirely easy, but it, it was <laughs> it resulted in good quality water without much treatment at all. I uh, just low chlorination. But then we went after some water supplies in the groundwater that required treatment uh, for nitrate removal or color and color removal of different projects. Um, but those projects benefited uh, the basin because we were taking these contaminants out of the basin as a producer. Uh, but it benefited RWD certainly um, because our customers had more access to groundwater in a diverse supply. And Metropolitan, just to kind of tie the whole boat together, um, provided us LRP money for those projects, uh, local resource projects money. So um, that's, that's a great example of regionalization up and down the line. Um, so um, beyond those two, two, those two sources with Orange County Water District and Metropolitan, our core of 25% right now, I would, I would say is maybe a little higher than that, pure self-sufficiency is our recycle water program. So we've been doing our brand of water recycling since 1967 here at Irvine Ranch Water District, which is not for drinking water purposes. We call it Title 22, uh, that's the water code, but it's basically for irrigation, for cooling towers, for toilet flushing, everything but drinking. And our benefit has been that over the years, as our communities have developed, um, we put in the drinking water pipes, the sewer pipes, and the recycled water pipes. So we haven't had to go back and add a, a whole new network of uh, distribution pipelines, like say, city of LA, Long Beach, some of these older cities who don't have any benefit. But again, going back to the solution of groundwater replenishment system, that was um, good for a couple of reasons. Uh, it ends up being potable water, which is great, but it, it ends up not requiring uh, a whole separate distribution system. So it's just a different way to do it. Again, you talk about silver bullets, it's not a silver bullet. It's what's, what is the best condition given the circumstances of your own community? Burham Ranch was a developing community at the time we got going. So our solution worked really well for us. Groundwater replenishment system worked really well um, for Northern Orange County, and we benefit from that as well. Uh, and the San Diego had its solutions that being down there in the pipeline. So going back to your silver bullet point, no, there isn't one. And it really needs to be understood. And, and, and I love, I love the fact, going back to customer communications, that folks get very interested when there's a drought. Um, I'm sure James and Dan and Mike have a lot more questions at, at neighborhood parties about the water situation than uh, in, in years where it's not, <laughs> it's not on people's minds. But um, but it really needs to, folks need to really understand what's unique about their own um, you know, local situation and how it fits into this regional picture. And, and I've said it many times, but the self-sufficiency is not the goal. It's just not uh, for Orange County, for, for really, I, I would say for any community that has the benefit of regionalization, it's this diversity concept. And, and not even, in all, I know Charlie, you've heard, we talked about all of the above. Um, you know, all of the above implies just do everything. I'd, I'd say consider everything, but strategically pick uh, the timing of which the, um, the easy water is gone. What's the next easiest? What's the next easiest? And work your way down that ladder of what's possible and what works best for your uh, local community. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, well, let me play off that and this both the silver bullet and what's easy and what's hard, because I, I actually I'm seeing a, a lot of questions that have uh, or pertain in some capacity to the issue of desalination. And and for say in San Diego, you guys have uh, you made that leap, you invested in and, and you're now physically operating a, a coastal desalination plant like I know you you're, you've got one still under consideration in, in Orange County. Uh, James, I know Metropolitan has been approached uh, many times uh, from a variety of different places for either o ocean desal or, or brackish desal. So I have to ask the question just because it's a theme that runs through about half the questions so far. Where does the, the desalination component fit into this equation? Is it, is it one of the easy, low cost, you know, easy peasy kind of things? Why don't we have one, you know, up and running everywhere like San Diego? Or, or is it one of those things like, wow, you know, you better really look at your conditions. You better really, you know, really study this thing because it's, it's hard to do. I'll just start with, I think there's pros and cons with each one of the options in terms of responding to a drought. The nice thing about desal is it's, it's pretty drought resistant, but on the, one of the more negative sides, it's very expensive. So, and, then, and there are operational issues that you need to be aware of and San Diego probably definitely could, could elaborate on that, but it's, it's an expensive water supply. And then it's also one thing that people um, need to understand in terms of Metropolitan's distribution system, we're basically designed to flow downhill. Once we bring the water into our region, the water flows down to the member agencies with, with very addi limited additional pumping. And the difficulty that Metropolitan faces with integrating desalination to our system as as we get closer to the to the to the ocean, our pipes get smaller. So the pipes are bigger the higher they're up, and then they get smaller as they go down. So it's not as simple as oh, let's just build a desal plant and and pump the water. I mean, one, it's a, extremely energy intensive on the desal, and then to pump the water up. But the infrastructure is not designed. At least Metropolitan's infrastructure is not designed to um, incorporate desalination all the way through our system. Dan, I mean, you have experience with this and kind of in your opening comments about how you sort of redesign or use the existing system. Is, has that been your experience that uh, as, you, as you produce desalinated water at the coast and trying to then get it inland or get it into the user? Um, yeah, well, Charlie, I think everyone should have a desal plant first off, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not cheap um, and it's not easy. Um, uh, and we've, we've certainly had our challenges as James kind of alluded to. Um, you know, when, when, our, when our board and our ratepayers uh, decided to embark upon the idea of desal, um, you know, we were looking at a, a dozen different locations and, and it took probably 12 years, 15 years to get to a point where we, you know, we decided on Carlsbad and then negotiated uh, what we have today, which is about $2,800 an acre foot for, for desalinated water. Um, you know, we, we have the ability to, to move it throughout our system. That, that's not an issue for us. Um, you know, in terms of the cost, there was no upfront capital um, for ratepayers for the project. So that's why the unit cost is so high. Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the problems that we've had, at least in the first five years of implementation, um, were largely an unanticipated operational issues that had to do with red tide. And you know some of that stuff is is unavoidable, but nonetheless, it it um, reduced the production of the plant um, by a few thousand acre feet over the past couple of years. But nonetheless, I look, I do believe it is is part of a well balanced, diversified portfolio. I think when you step back and look at things um, in your rate structure, and you have twenty eight hundred dollar water, five hundred dollar water, two hundred dollar water, you know the weighted average, the melded cost of your supply. Sometimes you have to, to put yourself out there and, and develop those expensive uh, sources of supply because I think as, as maybe Paul alluded to a little bit, all the cheap water is gone. Um, it's, it's really hard to just stick a well in the ground these days and, um, and, and produce that, that incremental supply that a wholesale agency needs. So um, I alluded to earlier, I think the future of our region is reuse and reuse is you know on par with the cost of of desalinated water. And that's something that our, um, our, our board is in our member agencies are interested in pursuing. And candidly, probably the only reason that we can do that is because we do have the cheaper supplies from the Imperial Valley. Mike, you're kind of in that eye of the storm right now. Your board uh, been considering and uh, you know, this proposed uh, additional desal plant uh, in, you know, along the coast. How, how do you go through this, this weighing this against 
the options of storm water, of expanding recycled water. Um, where does that fit in your portfolio? Yeah, at least on my screen, I'm right in the middle of the two. So uh, uh, we, are, we are going through that process, uh, Charlie. And uh, as has been pointed out uh, by both uh, James and Dan, I, I mean, uh, it, it is not easy. Uh, it is very expensive uh, or expensive. And what, where we're at right now uh, is we have a term sheet with Poseidon uh, to purchase uh, uh, 56,000 acre feet of water out of their proposed Huntington Beach project. Uh, it still has one final permit, Coastal Commission, to go through, uh, and then our board would consider whether to move forward with the project or not. Uh, certainly, cost is going to be a consideration, uh, you know, because it is an expensive source of water. Uh, and on the other side, uh, there, there's probably some that would look at it as giving increased reliability. So the decision is going to probably go between those that think that uh, uh, we need a uh, extremely reliable source of water versus one that is more costly than uh, our current supply. And uh, uh, that that's the decision that that our board is is going to have to take up uh, probably sometime next year. Paul, um, you know, how, how do you guys view this issue of, of desalination, whether it's uh, brackish water or or the ability of say an ocean ocean plant uh, being available? Does that fit into the Irvine Ranch thought process, and how do you balance that out with uh, again your rate structure? Yeah, so so on the on the ocean desal front. You know, Irvine's been pretty vocal um, about how it does not fit with our, uh, what we need in our portfolio. And, and Mike framed the issue really well um, uh, uh, with reliability and all that. And, and one of the questions that I like to pose to folks, particularly in Orange County, is sure, desal is a solution. There's lots of solutions out there, but what's really the problem that we're trying to solve? And, and, and again, Mike framed it. If reliability is the problem you're trying to solve, and, and this seems to come up in, in, in situations like we're in today, like, gosh, we need to be more reliable, more resilient. Are there other ways to solve the problem of reliability, resiliency? And for Urban Ranch Water District, at least as one, one, one of the producer agencies within an OCWD, we have other ways that we are actually already solving that problem. And we would like to be able to choose not to have to participate in a solution that doesn't really solve any problem. Uh, that we believe we have very expensive uh, when there's even less expensive solutions available to that particular problem. So I would just remind folks that it's really important before you front a solution or vote for a solution and uh, obligate our customers to a lot of money for a long period of time, please consider the, the problem you're trying to solve. Um, brackish water desalination, I mentioned earlier about our groundwater cleanup projects, uh, basically taking out nitrates. That is brackish water desalination, a form of it. Um, it's much cheaper than ocean desalination. Uh, it's, it's a fraction of the salt uh, to be taken out compared to ocean desalination. It doesn't need to be piped out of the ocean and then the brine discharge back in the ocean. Uh, and it usually integrates right into your overall system. It gives you just something with the brine at some point. That you do pull out of the water. Um, but th those are definitely uh, solutions that I, I saw. I think, Dan, your agency is in line for perhaps some federal funding for some salty uh, groundwater uh, treatment. I think that's great. Um, we've, we've grabbed uh, at those opportunities where we can, and, and hopefully there's more out there um, that other folks can take advantage of. But this is the, the cascading um, Solutions that we have available to us, and that's what I meant by being strategic in your, in your, in your, which ones you choose to, to uh, implement and when. Well, let me play off a theme that, that Dan raised, and I know James has talked about. We've all mentioned this issue about regional cooperation, um, and I'm getting a lot of questions here also about things like storage. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, as I recall, I mean, there were few entities other than Metropolitan and that large accumulation of customers that would have the wherewithal to fund something as big and complex as, as the uh, Diamond Valley Lake. But since we've got a number of other storage related issues that are on the table, uh, whether it's sites, whether it's other, you know, Southern California based surface storage, expanding or trying to find other ways, Mike, to 
to utilize the, the groundwater basins that are at our, our disposal, e even things like funding the modernization of state water you know, project you know, with the, the tunnels. It, are there opportunities, whether it's desal or storage or some of these kind of really big expensive projects to do cooperative arrangements? Are there others willing to help invest in those things? We read about you know, Las Vegas, perhaps, because of the Colorado River, perhaps willing in doing exchange agreements. Um, is that the kind of broader regional issues we need to look at? Or is this, again, something we should just be looking at Southern California and our relationship with the state and with the federal government? I'm going to open that up, James, I kind of whoever. I mean, I can start some of the discussion. I mean, Metropolitan definitely has invested a substantial amount of money in, in surface water storage. And we've also invested a considerable amount in groundwater storage with our own groundwater partnerships along the State Water Project and the Colorado River uh, Aqueduct. I mean, we've, we definitely think storage is a key element. I do think that surface storage is just getting much more difficult to, to de develop. There's the site's reservoir that might uh, provide some additional benefits in the operation of the, the state water project. But um, surface storage is getting more and more difficult. I definitely think the, the easier part of it is trying to figure out how we can better manage um, groundwater storage, whether it's locally or, or um, you know, in different parts of the state and how we can work together. I, I have to give credit to Irvine Ranch, substantial in terms of their investments in groundwater storage. They've got some substantial um, investments along the, the California Aqueduct with some of their, their storage programs and partnerships with MET. And, and I'll even uh, bring in OCWD in terms of their recent um, collaboration on the Santa Ana River Conservation Conjunctive Use Program with a, a, another state water contractor, San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. So there's a lot of different opportunities out there and we need to look at how Metropolitan can fit into that and, and work cooperatively with the member agencies and sub-agencies to enhance um, the use of groundwater storage or surface water storage in the region. And, and Mike, you, or Mike, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that, uh, and then I know Paul wants to talk about his, his uh, water banks, but, uh, you know, we, I know that on our board level, they're talking about uh, more regional type projects and supporting a sites type project above Delta storage where you can capture that, that water during, uh, during a wet year because what groundwater banks rely on is water. And, and, <laughs> and it's difficult to divert into these water banks or these groundwater basins unless you have somewhere to store it and then slowly release it. Uh, so, so that's where I, I, as I mentioned, I know a few of our board members are very interested in trying to promote the sites project, which I know MWD is, a, uh, is a partner with other water agencies in and, and really at the state level, try to get the state, you, you know, to cooperate in, in building these. I mean, these are statewide issues and it shouldn't necessarily be left on individual water agencies. If you're gonna have a water bond, why not just put a water bond and devote it to creating storage at sites uh, instead of trying to parse it out to uh, you know, 100 different projects. Uh, so that, that's just my editorial comment. Well, Paul, you, you, you and your groundwater banking, you know, the, the, the diversity of that portfolio and, and the importance of storage. Yeah, James kind of touched on that. So, uh, and this goes back to my comment, about the reliability for our DVD, um, you know, our solution that we chose to embark upon is storing water in the ground in Kern County in partnership with Metropolitan um, and, and others. And the, the part, so, so basically what we can do in a shortage year, if Metropolitan declares a shortage, we can pull water out of the ground and bring it down to our service area. Um, one of the neat aspects, so it's a great project, one of the new aspects of it, though, is this partnership concept between something we haven't talked about yet, urban and ag. Our two partners are obviously Metropolitan and, 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 and DWR and other state agencies. But I would say far and away, our most important partners are the ag partners we work with up in the Central Valley, Rosedale, Rio Bravo Water Storage District, and other agencies who have access to water during those wet years. So we've crafted our program not only to ultimately bring the water down to Irvine when it's needed in an emergency, but on a more regular 
less emergency basis is that we can share the benefits of groundwater storage with the agricultural partners that we have. And so that ag urban connection gets made. Um, I think we can all remember just a few years back in the previous drought, um, you know, the, the, the mandatory was enforced on really residential. Um, businesses didn't cut back, ag didn't cut back. I mean, there were, there were cons conserve, some conserving going on, but the, the lion's share of the, of the mandate fell on, on residential. There's a strong argument to be made that that was the right thing to do. Um, but I think having these partnerships together and not forgetting that ag is a huge player in water, as is the environment. You know, on the other part of um, the, the more recent um, groundwater project we're bringing online, the kind of third partner, other than our WD and our urban needs, our, our agriculture partners, the third partner, I would say, is the environment. Having water available uh, for uh, discharges into the, um, the American River uh, for pulse flow to keep salmon alive. Uh, like would be really great to have this year. So that's a, a real exciting thing where you start to see this integration of all of these different pieces coming together, um, you know, starting out with a need for, for an urban agency. So we've been really fortunate for that. Well, you can see this is a really complex issue and, and we're coming right up against the hour. We've got about five minutes left, but I do want to ask this last question of each of you because, you know, take this massive issue, I want you to boil it down into 30 second sound bites, if you would. Are we doing too good a job? Because it strikes me that one of the disadvantages in Southern California is a lot of our water is kind of underground or in pipes and people don't see it like they do perhaps in Northern California or in other states. And so in that context, if it's sort of out of sight, it seems to be out of mind until we run into these drought cycles and it's on the front page of the paper. So that's my question is, are we doing too good a job and what do we need to do with our public to sort of raise the awareness of this complexity and all of the intricacies and the decision-making process we, you all try to go through to try to make this really complex system work? James, I'm gonna let you boil that all down in a 30 second soundbite if you were king of the world. Are, are we doing too good a job? Well, I, I think that, you know, as water planners, we definitely want to do a good job so that customers don't worry when they turn on that faucet or flush the toilet that it, it's, it's working. So I think we've got that covered, but I think that there's still so much more that we can do in terms of public outreach, especially during droughts or shortages. Um, we, there's definitely room to improve, and there's definitely room for increased collaboration among people that have different resources, whether you know, the member agencies that have groundwater storage and Metropolitan that has surface water supplies. There's definitely opportunities for us to improve um, those arrangements and, and uh, develop and, and increase our reliability in the future. Dan, are you doing too good a job in San Diego? Do your, your folks really appreciate the value of, of, of what you deliver and the decisions that your board goes through to make investments and, and to balance this equation? You know, I, I think they do value it, um, but one of the things that we've been trying to focus on is the value of water and, and what that what water means to our local and regional economy, um, but also the tap water in particular. Um, you know, there, there are certain sectors of our community that, that simply have a stigmatism against tap water. I mean, I know we're talking about drought and conservation, but that, that still really is a big issue for us in certain sectors of, of our community. So education and outreach has, has become a, a big focus for us, um, both in terms of the value of tap water and, and what water means and the investments. You know, why, why is your water bill what it is? Well, maybe it is what it is because um, when a 15% uh, a voluntary mandate from the administration becomes a mandatory, you might not have to take that cut. And that's certainly what we saw in San Diego back in 2017. So, you know, you know I, I, don't, I don't think people realize what they're investing in until it's right in front of their eyes. Mike, does your, your constituents, your, your member agencies, do they, they have a full understanding of the things we need to do? Or, or well, is, well, is Orange County your, Water too, too good a job? To answer your question, are we doing too good of a job? The answer is no. Uh, we're not doing too good of a job. I, I think uh, where we lack, although we may have improved, is communicating to the public exactly where their water comes from and what is done to get that water to them. They don't have a clue. And, and we need to, I, I mean, we all think that they do because we live this day in and day out. <laughs> Uh, and, and we talk to each other. And, and, and so we, 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 we feel that, uh, it's, at least this is my humble opinion, that 
uh, that everyone understands. I, you know, I, I don't think that that's the case yet. We, we got to do more to educate the public uh, to explain why their water bill goes up when they're using less water, uh, to, to, to be able to, to, as I said, explain where their water comes from and, and, uh, uh, and why it costs what it costs. I'll leave it at that. Paul, uh, you, you've got a pretty sophisticated uh, constituency or are you doing too good a job? Are you, do, we, do we need to, to have, like the electricity industry, you know, they'll have their little bumps where we'll do rotating outages. That, that'll get everybody kind of excited pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> are we delivering a, a, a product that uh, is, is fairly priced and are we doing it too well or are there things that we need to do to improve? Uh, excitement's not the name of the game in our business. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with, with what Mike said. Um, and you can quote me on that. Um, he, For once. Yeah, <laughs> we absolutely need to do a better job with the things we talked about here. Um, the only thing I would add uh, is, is, is to, to, to talk about is water quality as well. I think there's a lot of misperceptions and kind of goes back to what Dan said about tap water. The water quality, uh, huge um, misconceptions about how all that works. Uh, and the only other thing I would add on without, I don't want to repeat what we said before, but one, one other aspect of water that we didn't really touch on, I, I think is going to really um, be something we're going to be contending with here for the immediate and, and ultimately long-term future is these communities that don't have a, a, a adequate water system, the disadvantaged communities, whatever they are, the back uh, community. It's and what ends up happening is so, okay, you asked me, Charlie, relative to Irvine Ranch Water District, I can answer that question. But that's not the answer anymore because what ends up, what affects my agency is not just IRWD and what happens within the four corners of my agency. The state is very interested in this human right to water um, and, and what happens in Porterville, California, when they run out of water, ends up affecting us down here in Orange County because it's a, it's a common theme and it's a common indignation that is rightfully felt by every Californian that there are corners of our state where people don't have adequate to safe water, let alone a, a reliable supply of water. That results in regulations that will get imposed upon um, even us down at the retail level. Um, there's a very robust conversation going in that space. It, 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 the headlines come out more and more uh, in these times, but those headlines disappear. The problem doesn't disappear for those communities. And that needs to be dealt with in a very thoughtful way. Um, and, and hopefully it can be done in a way that's more bottom up than top down because I'm, I'm very skeptical of a lot of top down decisions because they don't understand their business the way we understand it. So I'll just leave that out there as something else to think about. Well, thank you guys. And thank you all. Uh, we're right up against the hour and we promised we would only go the a uh, single hour. Obviously there are multiple issues and, and this can go a lot of different directions. So uh, I'd be encouraged uh, to have all of you join the Orange County Water District in its next piece of its webinar series. Uh, educate yourselves, uh, help your neighbors understand the complexities. But what I take away from today is it really is a complicated web that is reliant upon both regional, state, and federal cooperation. It's important that these professionals all work together. That doesn't mean we're all going to agree. You know, in fact, sometimes you guys uh, get, get pretty heated exchanges, but that's part of the legislative process for your weighing pluses, minuses, uh, various interests uh, of, of all the different participants uh, and what it really means in Southern California to provide not just reliability, but resiliency. Because we, we still need to know, you know, you can plan all of these wonderful systems and then, well, what happens when something goes wrong? That's when you know whether or not you're really resilient. Uh, I'm heartened that uh, at this current dry cycle, Southern California has resiliency in place. We don't know tomorrow, five years, 10 years from now, but I do know that all of you working together uh, will address that long-term resiliency and uh, would look forward to working with all of you as we educate. And then I like to say educate to advocate. So as people understand the various issues in front of them, they'll advocate for their own particular local interests. And that's how we make good public policy as elected boards and commissions. So I wanna say thank you to all of you. Thank you to Orange County Water District for allowing me to help facilitate discussion. Uh, and for those of you, again, if you want to see this, uh, it's going to be posted to the Orange County Water District Water News to, to their YouTube channel. Uh, take it, share it, use it. Uh, and I would just simply say get involved in your local water community. It's easy to read the headlines and be upset at the latest vitriol in Washington or Sacramento. 
the decisions made on the quality of your life happen right here locally. And so I'd highly encourage people to be engaged there. Thank you all for being with us and we'll see you again next time. Uh, we hope today you found to be informative and helpful. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.